Kenneth McGriff is one of the most notorious kingpins in American history. McGriff, better known by his nickname, Supreme, was described by authorities as a remorseless drug lord with significant ties to hip-hop and Hollywood. Although Supreme is now most infamously known for being the person allegedly responsible for ordering the shooting of rapper 50 Cent, he also had a long and storied career as one of New York's most feared drug kingpins. Supreme would lead a violent drug crew known as the Supreme Team. The Supreme Team operated like a Fortune 500 company, working around the clock, serving customers 24 hours, like McDonald's. They would also patrol the projects in bulletproof vests and cars in order to make sure that business was running smoothly. And business was great. At their peak, the Supreme Team was pulling in the equivalent of $500,000 per day. They also believed in playing as hard as they worked. The Supreme Team wouldn't hesitate to stunt with their drug money. Everywhere they went, they were dressed in the nicest clothes, pushing the finest cars, and in the company of the baddest women. This luxurious lifestyle would influence an entire generation of New York rappers, from Nas to 50 Cent. To put it simply, the Supreme Team were juggernauts in the streets. And Supreme was their leader. So, let's get straight into the story of Kenneth Supreme McGriff, a certified savage. Kenneth McGriff was born in Queens, New York, on September 19, 1960. He came from a blue-collar family, both his parents employed as New York City transit workers. His father is said to have also been ex-military. The family lived in a part of town known as South Jamaica, a predominantly black working-class neighborhood. Supreme was fortunate, however. He grew up during the pre-crack year, before crack and the war on drugs systematically destroyed the black family across much of urban America. That's to say that, like many other gangsters from his era, Supreme came from a decent home. So, how did he transform from a regular New York kid into one of the city's most legendary drug kingpins? To answer that question, we need to skip forward to the 1970s, to Supreme's high school days. In high school, Supreme stood out from the rest of his peers. He was described as intelligent, a talented athlete, and good-looking. It was clear from young that he was special. But, his teenage years were also a pivotal moment in his life. On the one hand, it's said that Supreme had plans to go to college, where he hoped to get an education and play college football. But, on the other hand, he also had to deal with the temptations that came with growing up in South Jamaica at that time. He saw the hustlers in his neighborhood. They all had nice things, got the finest women, and were treated like royalty. Everyone wanted to be like them. So, Supreme had a choice to make. Should he try to go to college, get himself a good education, and hopefully lead a successful life that way? Or, should he take the other route, and join the local hustlers on the block, chasing a life in the fast lane? It wasn't a difficult choice. It was still the 1970s. Segregation had only ended in 1964, when Supreme was only four years old. That's to say, that racism was still rampant across America. In 1973, for example, there were riots across Queens after a white police officer named Thomas Shea gunned down a 10-year-old black boy named Clifford Glover as he was walking down the street with his stepfather. Having said that, the only real opportunities available to young black men at that time involved blue-collar or menial work. Supreme and his peers would have been well aware of this. They had grown up watching their parents break their backs in order to provide just the basics. However, the local hustlers were different. They didn't have to do all of that. They did what they wanted to, lived with their middle fingers to the system, and yet, had all the nicest things. Seeing this, Supreme couldn't help but want their lifestyle. He then dropped out of high school, and hit the block. This decision would not only change his life forever, but also the future of Queens, and hip-hop. Oftentimes, people will say that criminals had no choice, that they were forced into the lifestyle. But, Supreme, he turned to a life of crime not because he had to, but because he wanted more. In his early hustling days, Supreme was running with the Five Percenters. The Five Percenters, formerly known as the Nation of Gods and Earths, were born in 1964, as a splinter group from the Nation of Islam. They would sweep across the ghettos of New York, and recruit thousands of disenchanted youth. This included Supreme, who joined the movement as a very young boy. They were also the ones who gave him his now infamous nickname. Supreme. The Five Percenters are an interesting group. They believe that only 5% of the world's population are enlightened to the truth, while 85% are ignorant, and the remaining 10% use that ignorance to oppress the masses. While many members use the teachings to live righteously, a small subset use the movement as a shield for their criminal activities. 
These criminal 5 percenters would become a serious force throughout the streets and jails of New York. They would also heavily influence Supreme. But the 5 percenters weren't the only gang on the block. During the 1970s, there were multiple gangs operating across Queens. One of those other gangs was the Seven Crowns. The Seven Crowns was one of the biggest street gangs in all of New York. At its peak, they were said to have around 1,500 members. Prominent members of the Seven Crowns included Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols and the Furtado Brothers. The Seven Crowns and Five Percenters would become rivals in the early 70s. Heroin was the drug of choice at that time, and many gangs would fight for control of the local drug market, as well as petty personal disputes. But things would change dramatically in the 80s. During that time, crack would hit the streets of New York and revolutionize the dope game. The 1980s were the golden age of New York hustlers. The reason why many now legendary drug crews were created during this time was because everyone was trying to capitalize on the new gold rush that crack had created. New York Times columnist Jim Dwyer now refers to the late 80s crack trade as outlaw capitalism. Really people were just making a lot of money and people were killing to keep that money. Crack swept through the hood like wildfire and it felt like everyone and their mother were either using it or selling it. This is also the time in which the Supreme team was created. Being the businessman that he was, Supreme recognized the opportunity that Crack presented. He then formed the Supreme team in the early 1980s. Let's now take a closer look at the Supreme team and how they grew into one of New York's most legendary crews. The legendary crew, known as the Supreme team, was born in the early 1980s. They were well organized and structured themselves like a true criminal organization, taking inspiration from the classic mob movie, The Godfather. Supreme was the boss. His number two was a man named Gerald Prince Miller. Prince was Supreme's nephew. However, he was only two years younger than Supreme, so their relationship was more like brothers. Although they grew up together and were family, Prince and Supreme were total opposites. As 50 Cent famously said, Supreme was the businessman and Prince was the killer. See niggas fed Prince and respect the train. For you slow motherfuckers, I'ma break it down illa. Supreme was the businessman and Prince was the killer. Supreme was cold and calculating, focused only on getting to the money, and only using violence when necessary. There's an infamous story that illustrates this point. The story goes that one day, Supreme was passing through the Basley projects when he saw a couple dozen people surrounding a group of cops. The police were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and now found themselves being pressed by the locals. The locals were yelling at the cops, and throwing garbage and glass bottles at them. Supreme saw this, and sprang into action. With just a few words, and a wave of his hand, Supreme backed everyone off the police, and escorted the cops safely out of the projects. Why would a drug kingpin help the cops, you might be wondering. Well, think about it. What purpose would hurting a bunch of cops serve, other than to bring heat to the neighborhood, and stop the money from coming in? While everyone was ready to wild out, Supreme entered into the situation thinking two steps ahead. That's just how he was. Prince, on the other hand, is said to have been the type who believed in shooting first, and asking questions later. As a result, Prince's name was feared in the streets. But Supreme and Prince weren't the only important members of the team. Under them, there were also several crews. Each crew was led by a lieutenant, who reported up the ladder to Supreme and Prince. Some of those lieutenants included David Robinson, aka Bing. Wilfredo Arroyo, aka C. Justice, who is said to have been one of Prince's right-hand men. Ronald Tucker, aka Tuck. Waverly Coleman, aka Teddy. And Colbert Johnson, aka Black Joss, a respected New York legend. Other prominent members of the Supreme team included James Antony, aka Bimmy, the blood uncle of rapper Waka Flocka. Troy Jones, aka Baby Wise. Nathan May, aka Green Eyed Born, who is said to have been Supreme's right hand man later turned mortal enemy. And many more. The Supreme team were primarily based out of the Basley Park houses in South Jamaica, Queens. They engaged in a wide variety of activities, but were most well known for selling large amounts of drugs, including powdered cocaine, heroin, and crack. One of their major suppliers was another New York drug kingpin named Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols. Fat Cat was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, black drug dealer in all of NYC, at that time. It's said that he also had connections to the Italian mob. At their peak, the Supreme team would sell roughly 25,000 vials of crack per week, earning them the equivalent of half a million dollars per day. They had a 24-hour drug operation, and would guard their drug territory with bulletproof vests and cars, even using spotters on the roofs of apartment buildings with walkie-talkies, to keep watch for the police. 
In the early to mid-1980s, the Supreme Team and other New York drug crews were able to pump crack without worrying too much about the police. The local police weren't paying attention and hadn't really caught on to this new drug that was turning the streets of New York upside down. But this would all change beginning in 1985. By the mid-1980s, the Supreme Team's name was ringing bells in the streets. They were basically printing money, making millions of dollars per year, pumping crack. And, they weren't hiding that fact. Like many of the other legendary New York drug crews of their time, the Supreme Team was flashy and would stunt with their drug money. Everyone knew their names, and their parties would later become legendary. However, word eventually got back to the police about this flashy new drug crew. By September of 1985, the police had the Supreme Team under surveillance and had their phones tapped. Police had heard a situation had been brewing, a situation directly involving Supreme. It said that one of Supreme's stashed houses, located down the street from the Basley Projects, had been robbed for approximately $80,000 and a bunch of drugs. Supreme reacted by putting word out on the street. He wanted his money and drugs back. Or else. The wrong person heard this, and then told police, who proceeded to monitor Supreme. The police then raided multiple Supreme Team stash houses, on September 10, 1985. Inside of one of the stash houses, they found Supreme and his crew, flushing cocaine down the toilets and sinks. Police would also find 8 kilograms of heroin and cocaine, glass vials, scales, cash, and guns. Supreme was then arrested, and charged with drug and weapon offenses. He would ultimately be sentenced to 9 years to life. That may sound like a lot, but, at the time, it was considered a very lenient sentence. This is because, at that time, the state of New York had one of the harshest anti-drug laws in all of America. The Rockefeller drug laws were operating in New York, and if you were caught selling two or more ounces of hard drugs, you would be sentenced to a mandatory minimum of 15 years in prison. Now facing a long bid, Supreme handed control of the team over to Prince. Prince had himself only recently been released from jail on burglary charges the year prior, in 1984. But, Supreme would eventually have his conviction overturned on appeal, due to a technicality, and would be released after serving less than a total of two years. However, for the time being, Prince was now the acting boss of the Supreme team. Supreme would be released in August 1987. It said that when he came home, each member of the Supreme Team had a welcome home package for him, consisting of thousands of dollars. It said that Supreme then held a meeting in the Basley Projects, where he was brought up to speed on the team's drug operations, before he then stepped up, and gave a speech, communicating his vision for the future. The year 1987 would mark the height of the Supreme Team. They were reportedly pumping 25,000 vials of crack a week, making the equivalent of $500,000, per day. Supreme was living out his wildest dreams. They had all the money, women, and cars. Their name was ringing bells across the country. And they threw some of the wildest parties, even hiring rappers, such as Run DMC, LL Cool J, and the Beastie Boys, to perform on stage. The Supreme team would also host local sporting events, similar to the scene in the classic TV show, The Wire. In the show, various drug dealers from East and West Baltimore competed in an annual basketball tournament. The show also featured a scene, in which a referee made a controversial call at the end of the game, leading the character Avon Barksdale, to then get in the referee's face, and threaten him. But, it's said that a similar story happened at a basketball tournament held by the Supreme Team. The only difference was, this wasn't a TV show. It was real life. The story goes that, in August 1987, Supreme was holding his annual basketball tournament, at Basley Pond Park. Teams were competing for $50,000 in prize money. Drug dealers were also in attendance, having placed bets on the games. Everything was going according to plan, until a referee made a controversial call, at the end of the game. It's said that a member of the Supreme Team then jumped from the stands, and beat the referee to death. All for the simple crime of making a bad call. But, the Supreme Team also didn't hesitate to share their wealth. They would help the youth, by sponsoring youth sports programs, and even paying for buses, to send local kids to amusement parks. They would also help the needy, by running turkey drives, giving money to people in need, and even reportedly operating a neighborhood store, where they would give away free food, and diapers, to the community. The Supreme Team did it all. And, it became clear, that the Supreme Team were now some of the top dogs in the streets of New York. As a matter of fact, the classic hood movie, New Jack City, is also said to have been inspired by two specific drug crews. The first drug crew were the Chambers brothers, who operated out of Detroit. 
The Chambers are accused of operating a $3 million a week drug operation that once accounted for half of Detroit's crack cocaine trade. Drop a comment if you want to see a video on them. But the second drug crew that inspired New Jack City was the Supreme Team. That's the level they were operating on. But less than three months after the basketball tournament, the Supreme Team would be taken down for a second time, following a joint investigation conducted by state and federal authorities. In November 1987, the police started kicking off doors. Members of the team were found flushing cocaine down toilets and even throwing bricks of cocaine out of windows. Police said so much cocaine had been thrown out the window that it was raining cocaine on the streets. Christmas had come early that year. However, police found something even more interesting while conducting the raids. They would find various instruction manuals in the possession of the Supreme Team. These manuals covered everything from how silencers worked to different methods of disguising yourself to avoid the police. That's to say that the Supreme Team were more than just a street gang, they were moving more like the black mob. Supreme was then hit with a kingpin charge for operating a continuing criminal enterprise. A kingpin charge is similar to a RICO charge, but is different because it's only limited to criminal drug organizations. The prosecutor on the case was a man named Sterling Johnson. Johnson was also from Queens and lived only two blocks away from Supreme. It's said that he went extra hard to try and take the Supreme team down, likely because he saw firsthand how they were destroying the neighborhood. Supreme ultimately pled guilty, would be sentenced to 12 years in prison, and would serve a total of 8 years, before being released on parole, in 1993. So, between 1987 to 1993, Supreme was off the streets, and it was Prince's turn to rule over the Supreme team. And his way of doing things would be much different. With Prince now in charge, he ran the Supreme team his way. Remember, Supreme was the businessman, and Prince was the killer. Prince would focus on increasing the Supreme Team's muscle, fighting against rival drug crews, and internally cleansing disloyal members. As a result, police would accuse Prince and Supreme of orchestrating at least eight murders, in 1987 alone. Prince would then be locked up in late 1987, on a state murder charge. With both Supreme and Prince now behind bars, the team was in shambles. So, Supreme ordered the team to shut down its operations, and the Supreme team was largely inactive, between late 1987 to 1989. In the meantime, however, something would happen that would change the New York dope game forever. In February 1988, a rookie cop by the name of Edward Byrne would be assassinated, while sitting in his police car. The man responsible for ordering the hit, went by the name of Pappy Mason. Pappy was the leader of the Bebo's gang, and worked for Fat Cat, the same kingpin who had been supplying the Supreme Team. The reason for the killing isn't certain. Some say Pappy ordered the killing following an incident, in which he felt the police had disrespected him. Others say that he ordered the murder as retaliation for Fat Cat. Fat Cat had been sentenced to 25 years in prison, after being convicted of ordering the 1985 murder of a probation officer, after the PO reported Fat Cat for a probation violation. Regardless of his reasons, Pappy Mason single-handedly changed the future of the New York drug game. Rookie police officer Edward Byrne was actually hit five times in the head, executed by a squad of thugs acting on orders from jailed crack enforcer Howard Pappy Mason. Mason wanted to show police and the community who was really ruling the streets. It was unprecedented practically that people would go out and murder a police officer just to make a point. The killing became national news. Soon, everyone in the country had heard about crack. And the storyline that drug dealers thought that they could target the police, enraged the country. 1988 was also an election year. George Bush would carry Edward Byrne's badge on the campaign trail, using it as a prop for his tough-on-crime agenda. But that was nothing compared to the NYPD's response. The NYPD would respond to Byrne's killing by declaring war on New York drug dealers. They formed an elite squad, dubbed the Tactical Narcotics Team, or TNT. The TNT squad had over 120 members, and tens of millions of dollars in funding. They would then launch a total crackdown on the streets, making over 3,300 arrests, in less than a year. In an instant, New York drug dealers had become public enemy number one, and police were doing everything they could, to make their lives a complete hell. Prince would ultimately beat the case, after an eyewitness changed their story. Prosecutors accused him of sending someone to intimidate that witness, but they couldn't prove it, and therefore had to let him go. Fresh out of jail, Prince decided it was time to start the team back up. With Prince as the new number one, he appointed a man named Wilfredo Arroyo, aka C. Justice, as his second-in-command. 
Under Prince, the Supreme team would start getting work from the Colombians. But things weren't the same. The team was making only a small fraction of what it used to. They went from making over 200,000 a day, to now only around 10,000. Whether it was because of a lack of money, or because Prince was a savage, the Supreme team eventually started robbing connects. In July 1989, members of the Supreme team were accused of robbing and brutally murdering four Colombians that they had lured to the Basley projects, under the pretense of a drug deal. The very next month, in August 1989, they did the same thing. They lured another two Colombians to the Basley projects, before duct taping their hands, tying plastic bags over their heads, and using baseball bats to beat them to death, as the Colombians were suffocating. Shortly afterwards, in 1990, Prince and 18 other members of the Supreme team would be taken down. Prince would be indicted for four murders, as well as various robbery and kidnapping charges, in connection with the earlier robberies of the Colombians. These were all state charges, though. Prince would beat the case on the basis of illegal wiretaps. However, this must have really angered the state authorities, as they then called in the feds, to re-prosecute the exact same case, using the exact same wiretap evidence, that was previously declared illegal. As a general rule of thumb, if you're indicted by the feds, just know you're going to jail. This is because the feds have a 98% conviction rate. Despite using evidence previously declared illegal, the feds were successful, and Prince was convicted under RICO and drug charges, and sentenced to six life sentences, plus an additional 20 years. However, he was acquitted of the murder charges. So, by 1993, Prince's run in the streets was officially over. However, in February of 1993, Supreme would be released on parole, after serving nearly eight years on that kingpin charge. But, while he was in prison, Supreme had done a lot of thinking. Over a hundred members of the Supreme team had been arrested, and sent to jail, at that point. Sitting alone in that cold jail cell, Supreme realized that the drug game was a dead end. He then had a vision of something different. He wanted to go legit. Like many prisoners, Supreme spent much of his time in prison, reading books, especially books by Donald Goins. He dreamed of getting out, and getting into the entertainment industry, where he hoped to make movie adaptations, of those Donald Goins books. However, there was an even bigger opportunity in the entertainment industry at that time, an opportunity perfectly suited for someone like Supreme, a respected kingpin from Queens. That opportunity was hip-hop. The 90s are often said to have been the golden age of hip-hop. And New York was considered the epicenter. Queens had also been a dominating force, as many rappers, including LL Cool J and Run DMC, would come out of the neighborhood. These Queens rappers were also well aware of who Supreme was, because, as previously mentioned, he had hired many of them to perform at Supreme teen parties. Hip-hop would allow Supreme to go legit, and potentially make even more money than he ever did on the streets. So, shortly after being released from prison in 1993, Supreme would hook up with a young DJ, known as DJ Irv. Supreme was a washed-up drug kingpin, looking for a way into the entertainment industry. DJ Irv, on the other hand, wanted the street credibility that would come with associating with one of New York's most notorious drug dealers. With Supreme behind him, DJ Irv then formed the record label, Murder Inc. He would also rebrand himself, now calling himself, Irv Gotti. Murder Inc. would slowly become a powerhouse in New York hip-hop, later adding acts such as Ja Rule and Ashanti. Supreme had also started bringing his movie visions to life. He had started making soundtracks based on Donald Goins' books, and would also make a movie adaptation of the book, Crime Partners. It's said that Supreme funded the movie through a combination of drug money, as well as legal money that he got from Irv Gotti. Crime Partners would feature rappers Snoop Dogg and Ice-T, and go on to make around $4 million. Things appeared to be going well for Supreme, and he appeared to be going legit. However, appearances were deceiving. Supreme couldn't stay out of the streets, and it's said that he was secretly moving drugs in New York and Baltimore, while working with Murder Inc. This would eventually lead to major problems, for both Supreme and Irv Gotti. But, first, Supreme would have to deal with a different problem, a problem named E Money Bags. Eric Smith, aka E Money Bags, was an infamous gangster turned rapper from Queens. Bags was a member of a gang, called the Young Guns, and is a street legend in his own right. Drop a comment if you want a video on him. Like Supreme, Bags was also a street dude, trying to break into the entertainment industry. He saw how much money the rappers were making, and felt like he should be getting paid like them too. The rappers were talking about it, while Bags was actually living it. 
He was also well known and respected by many rap legends, including Nas, 50 Cent, Tupac, Biggie, Nori, and Prodigy. In this clip, you can see Biggie asking the cameraman if they had heard about E, before Bags appears on screen and starts speaking. Bags was like a young boy to Supreme, being a whole nine years younger than him. At the same time, however, Bags wasn't going to let Supreme son him. In a recent interview with Vlad TV, G-Unit rapper, Tony Yayo, said that there were only four people in all of Queens, who didn't fear Supreme. And Bags was one of them. This then created a problem, after Bags felt that Supreme had disrespected him, after refusing to return money, that Bags had used to purchase a car. The story goes, that Bags had given money to one of Supreme's associates, to buy a car off of him. Bags then later changed his mind, and said, I don't want the car anymore, give me my money back. However, Supreme told his associate to say no, we're not giving you a refund. Bags took this as disrespect, feeling like Supreme had brushed him off, like he wasn't nothing to play with. So, rather than take the disrespect, Bags decided to go to war with Supreme. One day, on December 11, 1999, Bags ambushed Supreme, as he was coming out of a mall, alongside Black Juss. Bags didn't know Black Juss was in the car, and then proceeded to open fire, trying to kill Supreme. However, Supreme wouldn't be hit. But, a bullet would unintentionally hit Black Juss in the leg, severing a major artery, and causing him to bleed out. Supreme apparently tried shooting back, but his gun jammed. With Black Juss bleeding out, Supreme then rushed him to the hospital, where he ultimately died due to heart failure, caused by the massive blood loss. Long before drill rap ever started in Chicago, Bags would release a song, featuring Prodigy, on which he would talk about the incident. In the music video, he would also have his face covered, because he knew that Supreme had put a price on his head, for killing Black Juss. Since the days of Cisco, the guard was hard. Francisco dropped the price of the prize. Ice in my eyes. I threw the dice and had him twice in the stars, The death of Black Juss would rock the streets of Queens. Supreme was extremely angry, and swore revenge. Black Juss was more than just respected. He was very well loved, as he had looked out for many people. One of those people would be future superstar, 50 Cent, who would pay tribute to Black Juss, years after his death. In an Instagram post, 50 would say, quote, R.I.P. Blackie. Everybody will do you a favor, when you don't need one. But, when you fucked up, and somebody gives you a hand, you don't forget that shit. This n-word spirit was different. He wanted to see me win. 3.5 to 1000, that triple beam dream, you dig. End quote. With Supreme now putting a price on his head, Bags would link up with the several other drug dealers, who also had beef with Supreme, and wanted to go to war with him. Two of those other drug dealers that Bags would reach out to, were Troy Singleton, aka Big Nose Troy, and Nathan May, aka Green Eyed Born, a former Supreme team member turned rival. They would bring the war to Supreme, even allegedly catching Irv Gotti at a recording studio, and slapping him up. However, a new person would soon join this coalition against Supreme. That person was Curtis Jackson, better known to the world as rapper, 50 Cent. In the year 2000, 50 Cent was an up-and-coming rapper from Queens. But he was different than most other rappers. He actually had a real reputation in the streets, as a drug dealer and stick-up kid. His street activities also made him known to many Queens gangsters, including Supreme. That's to say, that 50 and Supreme didn't start out as enemies. However, 50 would drop a controversial track, in early 2000, called Ghetto Koran. On the song, he would speak on street politics, name-dropping dozens of local gangsters, and airing out their business. He would mention the Supreme team, and some of its most known members, including Supreme, Prince, and Black Juss. He would also talk about E-Money Bags, and Big Nose Troy. Unsurprisingly, the song was controversial. He was a street dude, who knew and understood the code, but still decided to release a track, publicizing street business. It's said that the song rubbed Supreme the wrong way, and many people would accuse 50 of being a snitch. Supreme also had another reason to dislike 50. At that time, 50 had already started beefing with murdering cardist, Jarul. 50 had gotten into several altercations with Jaw. 
50's associates had allegedly robbed Ja Rule, there was also a street fight in Atlanta, and 50 would also later be stabbed at a recording studio, after getting into a brawl with the Murder Inc. camp. Murder Inc. would also accuse 50 of being a snitch, after he allegedly filed a protective order against them, following the studio stabbing. It's said that 50 had also developed a grudge against Supreme. In 50's eyes, they were both from the streets of Queens, but, rather than take 50's side in the Murder Inc. beef, Supreme appeared to be supporting Ja Rule, who was an outsider. I'm a nigga Supreme in the house, what up nigga? You know, whole Murder Inc. family in this motherfucker. E-Money Bags had killed Black Joss, and now 50 Cent was shaping up to be a problem for Supreme. So, Supreme had to act. First, he dealt with 50. On May 24, 2000, 50 Cent was sitting in a car, outside of his grandmother's house in South Jamaica, Queens, when a car pulled up beside him, and a man got out of the passenger seat, and shot 50, nine times in his hand, hip, calf, chest, and face. The man thought to be responsible for pulling the trigger was gangster, Daryl Baum, aka Homo. Homo was Mike Tyson's bodyguard, and would be killed weeks later. 50 Cent would point the finger at Homo on his track, many men. Mike Tyson would also dedicate a fight to his fallen friend. I dedicate this fight to my brother, Daryl Baum, who died. I'll be there to see you. I love you with all my heart. After dealing with 50, Supreme would turn his attention to e-money bags. On July 16, 2001, Bags was parked in an SUV, in front of a house. That's when four hitmen from Harlem ambushed him, firing 40 shots into the vehicle. Bags was hit more than 10 times, and killed on the spot. Unknown to Bags, Supreme had ordered a woman to do surveillance on him. The woman had filmed his car, and then got on the phone, to tell the hit squad what was happening. Part of that video surveillance was released online. Here's a screen grab of what it looked like. Supreme had further ordered the hitman to videotape the assassination, so that he could later watch the video, and see them killing the person who had killed his dear friend, Black Joss. There is also a picture of E-Money Bags, slumped in his car after the shooting, that's circulating on the internet. However, it's not included in this video, out of respect for the family. With 50 shot, and E-Money Bags dead, Supreme would then turn his attention to Big Nose Troy. Supreme was worried that Troy would try to retaliate for Bags' murder, in the same way that Supreme had done for Black Joss. Big Nose Troy was then killed months later, on October 21, 2001. That only left Green Eyed Born as the last real threat to Supreme. But, Green Eyed Born had somehow managed to disappear off the face of the earth. Supreme therefore couldn't get to him, to take him out. After getting rid of some major enemies, you would think Supreme was good. However, he had made a fatal mistake. Remember I told you that the assassination of E-Money Bags was videotaped. Not only would police find it, but they'd find it in the most random of places. Police would find the tape, while executing a murder warrant, at a random house all the way out in Baltimore. Unbeknownst to many, Supreme had been spending time out in Maryland, where he was reportedly moving weight. But, before the videotape would come back to bite him, Supreme would be locked up in December 2002, on federal weapons charges. He would regularly go to a gun range in Baltimore. However, as a convicted felon, he was prohibited from possessing any firearms. The feds then booked him on federal weapons charges, which he would later plead guilty to, and receive a 37-month sentence for. However, the day that he was arrested on those charges, would be the last day he was ever a free man. First, on January 3, 2003, Murder Inc.'s offices would be raided by police. Police alleged that Supreme's movie, Crime Partners, had been financed using drug money. They further accused Irv Gotti of using Murder Inc. to launder Supreme's drug money. After going on trial, Irv and Chris Gotti were eventually acquitted in 2005, somehow managing to beat the feds. Supreme would then be charged for e-money bags, and Big Nose Troy's murders. At his trial, prosecutors alleged it was a case of murder for hire, and that Supreme had paid $50,000 a pop, in order to take out Bags and Troy. But Supreme's luck had run out. Not only did police have a video of E-Money Bag's murder, but Supreme's assets had also been frozen by the government, and he therefore had to rely on a public defender. In the end, Supreme would be convicted on the charges. The prosecutor originally wanted to make it a death penalty case. At the death penalty hearing, witnesses heard emotional testimony from the families of E-Money Bag's and Big Nose Troy. What you're about to hear is the saddest part of this entire video. Troy's then 14-year-old son would give emotional testimony, explaining to the court how hard his life now was, without his father. He would say, quote, My father was a wonderful human being. 
Some days, I always think, if he was here, my life would be much better. At school, I think of him all the time. One time, I waited for him, to see if he was going to come, and pick me up. He never did. End quote. Absolutely heartbreaking. E Money Bag's mom also said a few words, describing herself as the saddest person on the earth. This is the other side of the streets, that the rappers, and drug dealers don't tell you about. After it's all said and done, it's the families that are left with the pain. However, Supreme was spared the death penalty, and was sentenced to life. He's now been incarcerated for more than 20 years. Despite growing up in a stable home, Supreme would end up becoming one of the most notorious drug kingpins in American history. He would single-handedly change the course of history in terms of both the streets and hip-hop. Not only would his rise to the top of the New York underworld become the subject of legend, but his exploits would inspire an entire generation of rappers, the same rappers who would go on to create one of the most powerful cultural forces in world history, that force being hip-hop. As a result, Supreme's name rings bells across America, till this very day. And that's why, he's a certified savage. Please comment, like, and subscribe, if you enjoyed this video. More certified savages is on the way.